Hey guys, it's Sydney Wong here with Venture X, and I'm here with our intern. Hi, this is Guillermo. Oh. Um, so, today we wanted to give you a sneak peek about our company culture, and one of the best ways to understand what your culture is is actually to ask the people that make it up. So, it would be your internal team. So, Guillermo, tell um, everyone what you do. So, I'm basically a full stack uh, developer. Um, anything that's related with you know the back end system, mostly back end nowadays. I do a little bit of uh, front end and now uh, automated testing. Great. And what was the last thing that you um, implemented? The last big task that you the last big big task I implemented uh, Stripe. I actually implemented uh, did the whole Stripe integration into our system. And tell people who don't know what Stripe is. What is Stripe? Okay, cool. Uh, so Stripe is um, payment processing for yeah, basically payment processing in general. Okay, awesome. And um, so, as a part of what we do, we all have people from just everywhere. So we've had people from um, Egypt, from um, uh, Albania, and well, Guillermo happens to be from Montreal, which is why he's physically next to me. But usually, I, I don't think that I've ever actually met most of the people. <laughs> and um, but Guillermo, how do you find it uh, to work remotely? Well, it's good with caveats because the the good part is you know you kind of make your own schedule you're you know if there's any family emergency you're accessible uh but on the other hand like there's not really a stopping point so you're always carrying the work the job with you you're always slipping on on the task that you're actually producing so it's good in general like at least if you're independent if you work by yourself well, that's good, but you know, you carry it around. So you talked about independence, like what would you say would be traits of people who can work from home versus people who can't work from home? I feel like you want me to say organization, but here's the thing, I think drive is- It's your answer. <laughs> this is also why it shouldn't be the person that they work with to be the one asking the question. Right? It should really be like a neutral party, like this is when, Andre and Paolo should be coming back downstairs. Those are my two friends who actually work right up these stairs. And uh, they should be the ones asking this question because it would be more um, honest. But, uh, but what would you say? Okay, so personally, I think you, more than, than anything else, you have to be diligent. And that also comes more or less in how much respectful you are towards the, the company. And you have to believe in it a little bit, uh, at least a little bit. <laughs> uh, but yeah, diligence all the time, you know, you have to be committed to what you're doing and uh, you actually have to do what, what you can do. And if you can't do, you have to report soon, very quickly. Yeah. Um, and then how do you feel like, because this is your first time working remotely as well, right? It is. So yes. then like you don't actually see other like coworkers and, and things like that. You know that they're there, but they're kind of like there in spirit in, the, in a way. Like, how does that make you feel? Um... Uh, Again, like it's, it's, you know, there, there are multiple sides to it. Right. Because on the one hand, uh, if you're more of an introvert like myself, you don't really have to keep, you know, dealing with people all the time. Yeah. But on the other hand, like if you really just want to talk shop, yeah. at the very least, you know, like getting help, I think at least within our team, like people are pretty mm -hmm. accessible. But like uh, if, you, if you just want to, you know, make some connections, it kind of takes a while. And since you have a high turnover, you know, interns and, and people like coming in and out uh it kind of takes a while and, and sometimes you don't really have the time to make those connections profoundly yeah so what tips would you give to other people who are considering um being those things called like digital nomads or like working in their own schedules or those kinds of people like what tips would you give to them based on your experiences so far i think tempted as you may be you you might want to, to, to not like uh, adhere to a schedule. You might prefer to actually make a schedule for yourself. Like it can mm -hmm. be a very wild schedule, but it's much more beneficial to your, at least to your mental health, that you actually have a schedule and that you follow it. And you know, the whole idea of being a digital nomad or working indoors is that you are flexible. So if you try something and it doesn't work, you can just change it, you know, and you keep iterating on the schedule. Um, and, you know, 
always make sure you get enough sleep and always make sure you, you eat properly or and, and exercise and I think that goes with all developers though right they just kind of never want to stop picking at the problem yeah yeah that's a good thing that's a very good one like mm -hmm. if you don't just leave and breathe the job like have a stop point and that's something that I have a hard time uh, developing you know like I have a hard time dissociating from from I can't even sit on my computer while thinking about venture and stuff like on the weekend, I can just sit down and, and, and you know, play video games or whatever Yeah. On, the, on, on my computer. You can't or you can't? No, I can't. Why? Because I'm, I'm, I'm having this hard time dissociating from... Okay, so you know, yeah. So like some people, they would have uh, different computers or they would detach their laptop from a monitor, for, for example. Yeah. Um, so those are things that I know that some people do. And if I talk to Andre, he would, he would sometimes say, like, I haven't eaten in three days. And... <laughs> And, and, yeah. Andre's a friend of ours that actually he, he is the CTO of a different by. company. Yeah, yeah, he just came by. You guys have seen him on, on camera a bit. And, um, but he gets really like drawn into specific problems and then it just like zones out. It's really, it's really odd to see because you can see it on his face. Like completely. And he can hear me too. You can completely zone out by, by a lot. Because my voice carries up these stairs as you guys can see. Um, but, but yeah, so how would you describe the culture, um, of the company in a nutshell? One word, I think, and at least that, that what stands out for me, it's, uh, flexible. Great. It's really flexible. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, that's great. And then how do you find, like, your, your learning as your first kind of, uh, big developer job, taking on a lot of responsibility? Like, how are you finding it for yourself? Um, I think... I think the biggest problem is you're never really prepared. Okay. No matter how, how how well prepared you think you are, no matter how well you know the system, no matter how well like there's always going to be a bigger problem, and you're always going to have to break down the problem to spare minimum and, and develop it. Yeah. And that's something that I, I was not because like I think the big all the other jobs that I had were mostly um, bureaucracy jobs, and you know I I, I also went to call center for a while, and uh, like. It's really a completely different job experience. Yeah. In, in in the sense that it's much more, you know, you actually have to know what you're gonna do. Nobody's gonna tell you what you're gonna do. Yeah. As yeah. like any developer. Yeah. <laughs> seems. And then um, in a startup environment versus more of a corporate environment, what would you say? Oh, interesting. Um, I have access to the founder, to to the higher ups, right. which is cool. Um, and I feel that. Uh, to some extent, and depending on on the field, some of my ideas actually get carried on, you know. And I have some control over what what the uh, the final solution is going to look like, right. which is pretty cool. Uh, and you know, if you've ever worked on a, on a corporate uh, environment, like you you're meaningless and you're <laughs> <laughs> you are meaningless. <laughs> Man, yeah. I hope this does not go public. I, I hope it does. <laughs> With your name on it. <laughs> All of these corporates. <laughs> but yeah, like, uh, I mean, you know, the, there are their advantages, of course. But like, uh, at the end of the day, you're not as important as you were in a startup. I feel. Yeah. I mean, it's quite interesting that, that I think myself is important. Very similar to, yeah. And how do you find um, the mentorship program that um, is very unique to VentureX and is also very much more unique in a startup environment versus a corporate environment? Because they don't always kind of put that emphasis on, on these kinds of things. So that um, so describe the how, how you get your mentorship um, at, at VentureX. I think it's a very good window to how we work as a team. Well, so what happens is, uh, like, because cause for, me, for, for me specifically, I get mentorship from both uh, you and from our studio, Jonathan. So, because mm -hmm. uh, at some point, I want to become uh, an entrepreneur, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, for example, today we went to, uh, to Founder Fuel's uh, event. Yeah. Uh, and like going to this kind of event and actually having a feeling for what the, uh, for what the, tech startup scenario is. Yeah. Um, so that's where it looks like from, from you know, me with, with Sydney. And from me with, with Jonathan perspective is very much a, a, like I think it's the more normal one in which you have a developer, a senior developer, just, uh, you know, giving away knowledge from his years of experience 
uh, to to a more junior developer. So, like for for me and Jonathan, uh, we we met personally some sometimes, but the the bulk of our um, interactions in terms of uh, mentorship happens through which is like and, and Skype. Mm -hmm. and like if I have a, a big problem, and you know, like I spend as you said like hours or days yeah. just working on it. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll just reach out to him and he's just gonna find out this one simple thing and I'm gonna feel stupid for, for like 10 minutes. Because he can see it so it. directly and right. then it would take you like going through the weeds. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And like how do you think that would like enlighten you in different ways? Oh, it already does. I mean, if I'm productive at all nowadays at AdventureX, it's because of the, uh, of the mentorship. Yeah, oh, that we had. Yeah, definitely. You can see your own work um, being much more productive in in, in every aspect. Well, I hope so. Yeah, well, I mean, we see it that way, <laughs> so we hope you feel it that way. Yeah. That's good. That's great. And then, um, what kind of things uh, do you hope for the future of the company or the company culture? Interesting. Uh, future of the company and company culture. I would really like to see the team get bigger. Okay. Yeah. Uh, like I think right now what I hope you're talking about not just dev, like not just your team. Well, no, yeah, of course. Like okay. uh, we're missing, we're missing. I think I would like to see more designers. More designers. Okay. Yeah, we have some... one really great designer right now. Exactly. And she, uh, she, she has a lot on her plate. Yeah, that's the thing. And and like I think we, I would like to see a second opinion on on design that mm -hmm. is more informed than what I can provide and probably you yourself can provide. So. Mm -hmm. uh, like in, in terms of, you know, getting more people in there uh, and actually meeting the people somehow, you know, like, or, or you know, talking more to, to the people already in there. Yeah. yeah. Well, one of the things that I think that uh, you certainly do stand out, and this is something that Alex used to do a lot too, is to, ha is to um, reach out more and have kind of more um, one-on-ones with individ individual people, mm -hmm. but try and help them solve problems. Even if you may have the answer, you don't have the answer, or uh, just kind of want to open up their list of resources, that was something that um, that Alex used to do, and you were the only other person who did that besides him. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so that was one of the things that um, I know that, because he has a lot of different experiences, uh, mm -hmm. especially in, in, uh, in front end, but, um, but it was one of those things that, it, it was a personality trait though. So it's kind of like you get the flexibility to make your own opportunities if that's what you want. Because mm -hmm. as you can tell, um, everyone does work in very different ways. So they, there are just different opportunities that they want. Yeah, no, I, I feel like, do, uh, Sorry, do they know who Alex is? Sorry? Do they know who Alex is? No. <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting. Alex was another developer. <laughs> Context. Yeah. Okay. I yeah. feel like they could have guessed. Well, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no, I I see what you mean. Like, uh, I just did, didn't expect it though, because I I just assumed that's the way you deal with other people all the time. Like you just. But the way I deal with other people isn't the same way that everybody deals with other people. Okay. And um, I, for example, one of the things that I like to exert is leadership by example, okay. as opposed to just in theory. And um, that's a lot, that is something that first, because I am extroverted, that's one of the things that I like to exert and um, it's, it's part of my core beliefs, but it's, it's not expected of everybody, but it's also just not um, very easily done by most people. It doesn't come to them naturally, okay. you know? And so, um, and so those, are, those are all very different things. And so um, as a manager and as a founder, it's very, it's very like um, you can you can in encourage certain things to be part of a culture, right? But you can't push people outside of their own comfort zone and outside of what they want to learn and outside of what they um, uh, of like what their what their goals are, mm -hmm. right? So what's really important for us is that um, the way that we structure our internship program at the beginning, we always ask each individual person, like, what is your goal? What is it that you wanted to learn more of and different things? And so um, if they, if you wanted to learn both front end and back end, then we would give you tasks specific to that. But starting with languages that you already know, mm -hmm. or starting with bugs that um, 
that Jonathan or myself think that you can handle first. Mm -hmm. um, so then your first task wouldn't take you like seven weeks to do, you know? And then, um, but our different styles, as you can see that the way Jonathan manages people and the way I manage and the way that we give uh, criticism, feedback or praise are both very different. Yeah. He loves to praise everything. <laughs> Like he sees the best in everyone, and that's it, uh, it's, it's just it's a lot, and so and so um, and it, and definitely works in so many ways because he uh, he consistently believes in um, molding junior people through praises. Positive reinforcement. Yeah, positive all the time. I'm like, stop doing that. <laughs> he needs to go home now. <laughs> And, um, and I'm, I'm not that, that person ever. And so, but that, that's who he is. That's, mm -hmm. that's what he feels comfortable. And that's how he feels that, um, people would feel, um, love and support and all of these things. Cause that's just, that's part of it. Right. And, I think it uh, works though. I, I, I think there, there, there's, there's validity in both how you do it and how he does it. But if we were the same, I think that that would be bad. <laughs> Maybe. Because I, I think, think it would be too much of extremes. I, I, and, and hopefully Jonathan doesn't hear that, but I think if both of you were... No, we're definitely sending him this video. Like, <laughs> I think it would still work, but it wouldn't be as, as good. You know, I think that there's what value. Mean, as good. So we, we wouldn't have, like, we wouldn't develop ourselves as much. Right. I think you could still be productive if both people were kind of, you know, mm -hmm. hard on, 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 yeah. on the employees. Uh, but that's just me. I, I'm like this, this, uh, you know, closet to the fascist inside. But, <laughs> but like, if, if, if you're that's unexpected. If, if you are hard on people, you're probably, you know, uh, gonna get productive. But you're not gonna like. You're not gonna have the moral or or, or the incentive mm -hmm. to really produce more for you. Yeah. Which you think is important, even for themselves. Yeah. You know? Like. And for myself, I do like to be a very structured person. So even oh, yeah. in giving feedback, I'm very structured in a way that I like to give almost everything in a compliment sandwich. So it's very, it's very structured. It's purposefully planned out. Oh, it, it shows. Though. Yeah, and uh, it probably comes out very dry and uninteresting. But that's the way that I think it's most comfortable for me to deliver, <laughs> and and makes it as short and concise as like possible I, I feel um, and um, and I like to give a lot of very specific examples to prove um, both um, good and, and like positive and negative things because I think that that's kind of um, where you can take things that are more concrete and run with it and there's less uh, subjectiveness to receiving information when you have concrete examples. But again, that's because it's the way that, uh, that my style is, and I like to lead by example. So I like to provide as many um, positive examples as possible. And one thing that I know that was always uh, weakened and trying to insert it more into our culture is um, sharing more on the business end. So because I do so many different things, it's very difficult for me to share news because I don't know, I can't remember what I already told you. <laughs> Like, yeah. I can't remember it, but at the same time, I don't know what is interesting or important or things like that. The same way that I think a lot of entrepreneurs have difficulty sharing things on social media because they think their lives are not interesting. Okay, I did not know that. Yeah, so it's very important to share um, different things like this, like our company culture or um, how we do little tidbits here and there and share what we learned, but also share what we failed at. And that's probably the hardest one of all because you always want to put your good side when it comes to um, putting things out in public. Mm -hmm. uh, but most entrepreneurs and, uh, and, and uh, startups at different levels have a very difficult time with social media. It's not because we're introverted or extroverted, but I think that um, when I ask them anyway, they say, well, what we're doing is not that interesting. I'm just it, at my dinner table. I'm like, yeah, but what are you doing? Like it's, it's, it's always interesting, but it's very, it takes a lot of energy to be, to, to um, always be thinking about, about those things, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult. It's like, I think uh, Gary... Gary Vaynerchuk? Vaynerchuk said yeah. it's about uh, reporting and documenting yeah. as opposed to, to generating content. Yeah. yeah, so document, don't create. 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's what we were doing today um, with our event. So mm-hmm. that's why I had multiple phones because I was documenting what we were doing, um, who we were talking to. That's why I I tagged uh, when you were talking to um, P- Pivo Hub. Pivo Hub, yeah. Pivo Hub. And um, <laughs> Pivo Hub. And um, so just just like showing what they were doing and uh, what the event was about, where it was, uh, the kind of venue that it was at, these kinds of things. It shows a peek inside what the Montreal startup culture is like. We are in a Montreal landmark um, kind of building where there are two buildings that are put together. But if you see all of these different tiles and things like that, um, this is very into the heart of the startup culture is that we do refurbish and protect and reserve um, buildings that have been here forever. That's a very Quebec thing. And then actually a lot of them convert into startup spaces. So mm-hmm. this one was converted. There's a church out on Peel Street. It was a church, so that was converted because they have like, I don't know what's with their financial situation, why they are, a, why they are our co-working space. But it's a very oh. interesting looking space for events. Mm-hmm. But uh, as a co-working space, there's a lot of echo. <laughs> and oh, and here as well. Though. Here as well, but, but this, that one is a church. Right. Like the pews are still there, <laughs> like everything's still there. So that's kind of how um, a, that is a very like Montreal esque thing. So documenting these things are also very interesting, I think, for other people to see because it's not like other startup scenes around the world that are in newer cities or they they just have different kinds of places where they host things. Yeah. And so that does like show a lot too. Yeah, which is which is interesting. Um, yeah, and then I know that there's been like a lot of different kinds of um, changes that you've seen as well. Who would you, besides me, who was your favorite person that you've worked with <laughs> and why? Wow. Or like you can pick one example from a team member oh, that like so affected unfair. you. I didn't say who was your least favorite. I said who oh, was your like yeah. one example of like a favorite. Because like everyone has, has a thing, you know, like everyone has... <laughs> Well, everyone has a bad habit. <laughs> All of them. No, no, like everyone has, has you know, something interesting about them. Like, uh, like uh, right now we're working with uh, Fatima mm-hmm. and like she is, she, she embodies Venture X precisely because she's very flexible. If, even when, when you're giving like new stuff to her, mm. uh, she, she quickly, you know, overcomes it and, and implements it the best way she can. Yeah, she's a very fast learner. Uh, exactly. And like previously we had Ken, was uh, just this, this amazing, uh, I guess he was full stack engineer, mostly, mostly backend, and he was really good at finding bugs and uh, taking care of bugs. Yeah. So uh, why, why did you think Ken had this like um, kind of direct ability to attack things? I, I, like what would you it call might it? might be experience, but I, I think it's deeper than that. I think he has like this, this whole sense his whole sense. His whole sense. Like it's like a sense. matrix sense. Exactly. Of, of where the code is going to fail, you know? Like, for me, it's amazing. And, and maybe just because I'm, I'm a noob, but, like, for me, it's, it's it's just amazing how he, you know, quickly comes up with, oh, okay, this is probably what the bug is. Or, you know, I found a bug in this. Or in that. Like, it's it's so cool. And, like, Alex, uh, from, from way before, like, he is more of a... Way before. Wait, well, I mean, it's been, what, two months? Like, that, that's, you know... Uh, whole in time. So Alex is more like a, a personal, like it's the personable engineer. He's very personable. Yeah. He's very likable. Yeah, exactly. So he, he made me feel at home uh, just working in there. And again, like, you know, uh, Jonathan, as I said, like he has so positive and positive thing and like he has so many stories to tell. Yes, he has a lot of stories to tell. Yeah. So, just to let you guys know a little bit more about, uh, about Jonathan, he once drove me to the airport from downtown Montreal to the airport is 30 minute drive. Right. I only asked him one question. <laughs> I asked him, how was your weekend? <laughs> that took 30 minutes <laughs> of the entire drive for him to tell me how his weekend was. I didn't talk at all <laughs> in the car. And then he dropped me off, and he was just like, just done. And I was just like, <laughs> I don't even know how to react. There were no follow-up questions, because I was just on the plane. And, uh, yeah, so, 
And you can tell by Guillermo's expression that that's a real thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. That would just happen. Like, we went, uh, he invited us for drinks the other day, and, like, I think I said, you know, hi, how are you? And he told me the story of his life, basically. <laughs> it's really interesting, by the way. Like, it's worth the time. It oh, just, yeah. It, it, he it, he like, has it was, like, quite a life. Three hours, you know. <laughs> Those are interesting. That was the only reason why he was never interviewed by TechCrunch. They just don't have enough film. <laughs> <laughs> that's the whole reason. They're like, we got to cut this guy out. Totally. <laughs> oh, that's very good. I, th I think that one of the most like interesting... So Jonathan used to host um, events at WeWork, which mm -hmm. was a place that has a lot of different startups and is actually... It's a, it's a brand uh that's that's franchised everywhere mm -hmm. and so in montreal uh we work it was like free to host events and he hosted startup events where they had open bar and he was the only one didn't, that didn't drink at yeah, the open bar yeah that's super awkward like he, he he said let's go off for drinks and then i come in i come in early i order a beer or whatever and he orders coke and i say well are you not, <laughs> not gonna drink oh i don't drink and like i mean <laughs> It was your first time meeting him. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was super good. awkward. <laughs> That's, and he gives you no warning about yeah. that, too. I so think it does great. it on purpose. I don't know. I think it does it on purpose. I don't know. I drink all of his liquor cabinet. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, he, he's, he's a very, very interesting character. And it would seem like the way that he talks, that he does drink a lot. <laughs> he doesn't. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah, so um, he does a lot of interesting things with different like startups and things like that. And one of the things that um, one of the things that I because I'm a very competitive person, but for no reason. Well, <laughs> no, no, no. It's really for no reason. I don't know the other people that he worked with necessarily. Okay. But I'm still like, am I beating them? Because <laughs> I just want to know. And then he's just like, am I at least beating this? So there's this um, older startup. Mm -hmm. I'm like, am I beating him? And because he's the only one that I know by name. And um, yeah, and so then I would get him to give a realistic sense <laughs> of comparison because then it would, it would just feel better. Or, or so I think. And, um, but yeah, so it's, uh, it's, it's very, very interesting in that way. But um, if you were to describe... Um, uh, your time at Venture X so far in a few words, how would you describe it to our audience? Um, I think this is the, the software development education that I never had. And, and, and like a whole... Or, or really, like the startup, the startup education that I never had. Then uh, just from end to end, you know, from, from making the product to making the connections with people and making everything meet in the middle. Like that's, uh, that's what I see VentureX as for me right now. That's great. Yeah. And so if you were to ask me any questions, because I know that we don't have a lot of time to talk during the work week, what questions would you have for me? You kind of covered, like I had two interesting questions, but it kind of covered uh, this oh, one okay. of them, uh, which, uh, which was, how do you actually, you know, manage the people? Like, what are tips or, or tricks or, you know, ways you can manage and acquire talent the way we acquire venture Um, So the way that we acquire talent is it's an it's always an ongoing process. And actually, a lot of startups do ask me that. A lot of my startup friends ask me that because mm -hmm. they have a lot of trouble with it. Um, there are different, so there are different ways um, when you're starting out. One of the challenges is that it's you can never compete on price because you would always lose. Mm -hmm. You can never compete against a Morgan Stanley or Ubisoft or an EA Games um, because they will have the best developers. Mm -hmm. They 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 just like you will always lose. So um, you have to find out what, and this is the same when it comes to customers because again uh, again with customers you can't compete on price. The more that you discount, the more that you will lose anyway. So you have to find out with customers, employees, anybody, what is their um, intrinsic motivation. So what is their internal motivation? What it is that they're trying to get out of it? And then you have to structure a package that is um, worth it to them. So I always find out what their goals are. I find out um, what they're trying to achieve, when they're trying to achieve these things, what their future looks like. So I know exactly when um, Fatima is going back to school. 
she is doing an online course and things like that. I know exactly um, what uh, uh, you know their their different backgrounds are and, and their different strengths are, and making sure that that's complementary, of course. But um, really understanding what their goals are and making sure that it's aligned with how you're going to help them achieve it, either through different um, mentorship or through different opportunities or um, different kinds of things. But the most important thing is that to understand the other person in front of you, you have to um, make sure that their needs are fulfilled and then understand what is your minimum requirement. So our minimum requirement is that we made sure that you were able to pass the test. So we always give um, an, the same um, coding test to everybody. When I applied for a non-programmer job in Silicon Valley, I, um, a Tesla gave me an HTML test. And I was not required to code. Mm -hmm. So I brought it to all of my friends going, why are they doing this? This is not even what the job description was. And they're like, they want to see if you can do it. They will never require you to create the newsletter because we were doing um, email marketing, but with a very specific software that I was licensed to do. So that's what we were supposed to do. So I understood the value of a minimum requirement. So I took that same model here. It's not very common for um, the rest of Canada to make you do these kinds of things. Um, but we had to have these, these different standards in place in order for us to streamline better and in order for us to move them. Okay, so are they at the, the questionnaire stage? Are they at the testing stage? Are they at which stage? And it's, it's kind of funneled the way that a customer relationship management is funneled. So that's what I mean when I said that um, when you're looking for talent versus when you're looking for um, customers is actually the same mindset. You have to find out um, what your minimum requirements are versus what uh, their goals are. And you have to make sure that that matches. Does that make sense? Uh, it, I think follow up, the natural follow-up question is, what do you qualify? Like, give me an example of an intrinsic motivation. So intrinsic motivations would be I want to, um, I am okay at Angular J JavaScript, mm -hmm. but I want to make sure that I'm an expert at it. So that's great. So then we give you everything that is front end. <laughs> okay. So then you will be an expert at it because you have to practice with all these different libraries. Mm -hmm. And you have to practice with making sure that it works in these different ways and, um, and, and all of these things. So that would be um, a motivator because this is the part of your resume you specifically asked to increase. Mm -hmm. And that's great and that's fine. And then um, if you wanted to practice uh, more intricate things. So, so for example, one of the very difficult tasks uh, that was assigned to Ken originally was um, to make the runway work in real time. Mm -hmm. That is not an easy task for most people. But, um, but that was the kind of thing that he wanted a really strong challenge in. And that challenged a lot of different parts of the code. Mm -hmm. So that's why um, you know, he was something that, that we thought was perfect for, because that's the kind of thing that would be an intrinsic motivator for him. Mm -hmm. Because he would forever be able to use any kind of algorithm, make it work in real time, and that's, the, like, that's kind of like the minimum requirement for a lot of different social apps these days. Okay. And a lot of different business apps these days as well. Is to make things work in real time, is to make things understand pattern recognition, is to uh, build the kind of entire infrastructure for, for those things. But as um, you know, a couple of the front end developers um, that, that you've seen, for example, they would hate doing that. Mm -hmm. That would not be fun at all. Mm -hmm. So you see what I mean? No, yeah, okay, okay. So yeah. It, it's literally like, um, literally what the person wants. Literally what they want. Yeah, yeah. This is what they. This is specifically what they asked for at the beginning. This is what they want. Um, and um, if they wanted specific kind of uh, tutorials or um, different kinds of things, that's also part of what they want. But these are the the hard skills that they specifically did ask for. But it's not like uh, it's not like an abstraction, like an abstract, uh, you know, principle behind what they want. It's literally, you know, you yeah. let them ask first. Well, that's a good that's a good thing about talking to uh, developers. They're not very abstract. Okay. They're quite specific <laughs> in like this is what I wanted. Okay. You have not provided this. You know, <laughs> this is what I want right now. Okay, yeah. Right, so yeah. that's one of the good things is that they tend to be very detailed. Okay. Yeah. And so, and then if they, uh, like the most, 
non-detailed one was probably yours when you're like, I want to learn a bit about everything. That was probably the least detailed answer. Well, because, you know, I, I want to get spoiled right now, but that's the thing. Right. But um, also you were one of the only ones that didn't work in a, in a development team before. That's true. That's, so that was a big difference. So you didn't really know what you liked or didn't like yet. That's true. So, I mean, that was perfectly fine. You came in with, like, no preferences. But just to give you an idea, everyone else's answer is much more detailed than that. Really? Yes. Really? Much more. But because they all, they all worked in different things, either in school or um, in a workplace, so they knew what they didn't like. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. That's, that's very valid. I know what I don't like. I don't want to write a, a Tesla newsletter in HTML. <laughs> that's what I don't want to do. True. That was mean. Well, I mean... Uh, and they gave you less time. I gave, you, I gave everybody two days. They only gave me one day. But it's just HTML, though. So? I'm just saying, like, you should be able to do HTML. Quite quickly. It's not part of the job. <laughs> uh, I, I did have one, one other question. Yeah. Um, so in terms of, you know, your startup uh, or, or startups in general, when mm. do you know, like, when do you know is the time to actually jump in and do it? Or if there's ever a time that, that you have to, you know, are you bringing an idea that the, does the idea have to have a certain, you know, topology or or like, when should I should I you know just drop everything and just hop into it? If right. I so, I, so I think that those that it comes from different contexts. Mm -hmm. So there are some people that jump in from school. There's some people that jump in when they're living with their parents, and there's some people that jump in from a full time job, mm -hmm. right? And so I think that so one of the things that uh, that Gary Vaynerchuk touches a lot on is when you're coming from a full time job because it's kind of like what he knows, right? Mm -hmm. And so. Um, and so when you're coming from a full-time job, a lot of the people that I talk to, they tend to say that the, one of their biggest regrets is to not stay at their job longer before they jumped in full-time. No. One of the most um, savvy entrepreneurs that I know is actually, he's here in Montreal, and he is very financially savvy. And so, he, well, he also works in fintech, but he's also very, he's very financially uh, Savvy, he's a, he's a friend of mine. Um, we used to actually do presentations together at Jonathan's events. Okay. Yeah, those at, at WeWork. So he was one of my uh, panel Blame colleagues. Him. Sorry? Blame him. No. 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 Um, and so, yeah, so he stayed at his job for a really long time until they got to product market fit. And that is actually when, or actually just before product market fit. And then um, that's the time when he gave in his week's notice. And then that's the kind of time when he jumped in. So he jumped in when he knew it was conservative enough that he knew that it was, um, that it was going to have enough traction. So he had enough purchase orders or he would have enough um, pre-orders where he have enough letters of intent. He would have enough um, known engagement on, or all these things, right? Essentially, you can do so much um, with your with your time, because the only reason that you would jump in or not jump in is for, is one of two reasons, right? These are the only two reasons that would assess your risk. It's either your time or your money. Mm -hmm. Those are the only two reasons. There's no other reason. Mm -hmm. There's no like emotional attachment thing. So, well, don't you think there is? No, I think that um, when it comes to your business, you of course like it and everything. But this is this is the thing too. Anything that any like if you're emotionally attached, that means that you would probably be very afraid of what other people think of it. Like when you're talking at a networking event, for example, um, the way that you are delivering your 30 second pitch, which is how people introduce themselves that you just saw, um, that is really um, emotionally driven. If people um, immediately disagree with your idea or they say things like, oh, that already exists. <laughs> or things like that. Yeah. But the only thing that you can trump it with, with that as a response is about, um, well, this is where our company is at. Mm -hmm. As in, um, we're only in business for this amount of time, and we're, or we're still in business for this amount of time. Or we are at um, $100,000 in revenue this year. We're at a million dollars in revenue this year. So when you're answering with hard evidence, which is time or money, your um, the other person's like emotions kind of adapt to that. If there's something that you've always wanted to do, that's great. But your mission is not the same as your business. Your business is the way you're executing your vision. 
Sure. Right? Okay, Our that, vision that, is to help the 90% of startups that fail in their first year or their first two years because that's a real statistic mm -hmm. and it's a very, very high um, dramatic okay. levels of startups. You know, that's also not true too. But the execution is your business. So your execution should be tied to the hard facts of time or money or things like that. Um, so when it comes to when should you quit your, your full-time job, it should definitely be when you have your product market fit. It should definitely be when you, um, when you do have enough traction that it makes sense. You've proven out your business model and you have enough to be able to uh, sustain or you have enough to be able to do you know, these kinds of things. The, a lot of people do tend to quit early um, or start their business early because they feel like they need to just put more time into it. But here's a very good quote from one of my, um, I forget which famous entrepreneur said it. He said, you, me, and Beyonce at the same 24 hours in a day. Yeah. That's how you use it. Mm -hmm. And um, um, Richard Branson, when he first started Virgin Airlines, um, he worked so hard to get a very unique deal where he would only have one airplane. I know, it sounds ridiculous. He only had one airplane, yeah, I know. which is very okay. expensive. Um, but if he wasn't successful, he would actually give the airplane back. So if he wasn't able to prove his business model and take the risk of that one airplane, he would diminish his risk by saying, if I wasn't successful in, um, you know, the most popular f uh, route in the U.S., which uh, I think was like New York, San Francisco or something like that, um, then I would give you guys back the plane. Is that a deal? And so this is a huge risk, but it takes so much time to work that kind of a deal with somebody who's not known. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's also um, a very conservative way to go about it because you are you were spending all, all of your time, but you are saving all of that money because you don't actually have to buy 48 airplanes. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? No, yeah, it totally does. Yeah. And so that's how you build things little by little um, until you know that this is the right time to, to jump in. So the, the biggest people, the, the people who look like they're the biggest risk takers actually diminish a lot of their risk mm -hmm. um, through a lot of the preparation. And I think that's like... Um, the best way to learn is through a lot of other people's regrets as well. Oh yeah, it does make sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you validate until you're ready to play. Mm -hmm. Because as you saw, our, our friends who were just here, for example, one of them is going back to a full-time position mm -hmm. at his old company um, because they haven't finished their validation and they kind of have to kind of go backwards. But if you do that, then you're kind of stopping your own traction. You know? And... Um, and it might take then longer to, to go about it, as opposed to you doing it little by little on the weekends, at, uh, in the evenings, or whenever, and uh, you're, you're still moving that momentum. Mm -hmm. So that's a really big difference in how much time you're saving. But like right now, I know that in, in our day and age, especially with uh, the millennial entrepreneurs, they're very used to instant gratification, so mm -hmm. everything seems like it takes so long. Yeah. They're like, why are you like still not there yet <laughs> like why is it taking so long yeah no definitely yeah so yeah, patience be, yeah being exercising patience is probably um one of the hardest things and actually that was one of the last uh things that i talked about at um the last podcast i did with brayden uh Wallachy, the hyper social entrepreneur okay. yeah um go to the black screen yeah, the one with the black screen because <laughs> I didn't want to put on my camera. Okay. He asked me to put on my camera, but because I had the flu, I didn't want to put on my camera. And so then he's like, okay, well, I'm not going to be the only one putting on my camera. So then we both had black screens because we couldn't figure out on Zoom how to put up the profile picture and just have, like, how Skype does it really easily. Yeah. Zoom doesn't seem to have that, that feature very easily accessible. They don't allow you to just put up a profile picture in a very easy way. Mm -hmm. I'm probably going to get comments being like, this is actually how you do it. <laughs> <laughs> you just couldn't figure it out. Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah, but we no, between the two of us, we couldn't figure it out. So I think it's not true. <laughs> I think it's not true. But, um, but yeah. So it's Chinese New Year tomorrow. Chinese. What is your animal? 
Oh, I think it's uh, I think it's the the pig. It's the pig. Yeah, ninety five. Oh, that's so funny. You know what? I actually so, um, I was I was with someone yesterday who actually was the year of the pig because we looked up his year, mm -hmm. which means that he's twelve years older than you. Okay. It's every twelve years yeah. it's the same animal, and so looked it up. Um, I don't know what website I was on, but usually with like um, Chinese symbols, they're generally all good. But I kind of landed on a website where everything about the pig was bad, <laughs> or non, or not. Uh, all the good things were not what describing did him. You read the I don't know. Pig. He was also a developer too, so it was like, yeah, this pig's very outgoing. <laughs> And very good at investments. <laughs> and he's like, I'm none of those things. <laughs> and he's like, and I hate investments. I don't invest in anything. And um, so the, I think those were like the only two good things. And they were just like, yeah. Um, yeah, it was, it was really funny. They were, they were talking about like the pig being influenced by his or her environment easily. I'm like, this is, doesn't sound very good. Or like they're saying that they're unusually accommodating. And I was like, why do they have to use the word unusually? <laughs> so they, I, the, the words that they chose just like made it seem like I was not reading the right thing out loud. The, I read the whole thing out loud oh, too. Or you were reading the right thing and it's just pretty uh, bad. It's, I don't know. Oh my God. But no one in my family has that symbol. So I never knew what it represented until the question was asked right here. and that you're not in my family <laughs> so no one in my family is more than 12 years older than me exactly or i not not me sorry um than other people who are this you're the pig mm -hmm. um but but yeah so yeah i don't know it was weird well what's your animal the rabbit the rabbit what 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 is the uh um oh those things the good things don't represent me either it says I'm very observant, which I I'm, don't think I am, and it says I'm very shy. Which um, you're not. No. Uh, the only one that does seem uh, to represent is it says I'm very intelligent. But the other two I don't think are true. I'm not sure how true these uh, symbols really are. Well, yeah. <laughs> News flash. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. But good luck with yours. It seems to be pretty bad. Exactly. Yeah. Do you have other things that you wanted to ask me? Uh, I, I think I'm good, yeah. Those are the main ones. And All right, we won't have one. another event for a long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have no idea when, when the next ones are. I uh, don't know. But, uh, yeah, so let's actually go up and, like, bother our friends. We're going to go to their, we're going to go to their lab. They and I will... Nintendo Wii, it's so cool. Okay, that wasn't really, like, the purpose of being in this building. <laughs> so, this is a uh, Notman House. I'm going to turn the camera over. What? How come I can't do this? Yo! 